My throat is hoarse from screaming. I pace my writer's room back and forth. I know its measurements intimately. The typewriter stares at me from atop the writing desk. The blank page in the roller mocks me. I'd throw that thing through the window if I could. I squeeze the clicker in my hand. The thing that saved a whole town and trapped me in this dark place. How many pages have I written since then? How many hells have I endured to bring the one perfect story to life? The one story that would help me escape and return to Alice? I remember Alice walking into the study, placing a cup of coffee next to the typewriter, kissing me on the cheek, saying goodnight. Alice. The memory is like sand on the beach being devoured by the tide. With each ebb and flow of the waves of time, I lose more and more of my past. Alice walking through the door with a bottle of champagne to celebrate my first book deal. Her eyes so full of pride. Her eyes. Her eyes. What color were her eyes? When the waves take away my last few grains of sand, when there's nothing left to remember, what will be left of me? I grasp at the grains of sand I still have. Alice, my books, my apartment in New York City, my vacation to Bright Falls, and Night Springs. Yes, I was a young, scrappy writer when I was hired to work on Night Springs. One of my first episodes was about a heroic escape. I put my characters through such danger, their escape felt so triumphant. Get to the typewriter. Get to work. This is the one. I just need to remember the story exactly as I wrote it so long ago. Then I'll be free. The clack of the keys is a familiar refrain. It brings comfort and torment in equal measure. I type the name of the episode upon the blank page. Dead of Night. The decaying city crumbles behind them as they run through the forest. Their exodus from the city was not easy. The fog closed in on them. They had to get out. They were pursued by the very thing they had summoned. Only four of them had made it out alive. But home was still so far away, across realms, in another dimension. And all they could do was run. Eloise grips Darren's arm, holding it tight around her shoulder. The dread had hurt him badly, and he'll bleed to death if they don't find a way home. Adrian urges the group onward, further into the forest. The trees grow thick around them, and Michelle yelps as a branch whips at her arm. The trees stand shoulder to shoulder, forcing the group down a single path through the forest. The ground quakes, and Eloise plants her feet. She's been carrying Darren for so long, and he is so, so heavy. Somewhere behind them, the dread bellows a hungry cry. It wants to feed on their misery, on their sorrow, on their souls. And it's getting closer. Alan Wake watches as his characters struggle for a way out. He can't see one. The trees stand shoulder to shoulder, flanking a path that ends in a wall of billowing fog. And the sight of it turns Alan's stomach. Keep them away from the fog. No matter what, keep them away from the fog. Adrian gasps and points in the direction they came. A twisting, writhing silhouette blocks what little light remains in the sky. They all watch helplessly as the dread approaches, getting closer and closer, until... I sit back in my chair looking at the words on the page. It's always been a pain in the neck to format a script on a typewriter. But there it is, my episode of Dead of Night, just as I saw it. I remembered every detail of the script perfectly. The strangers who found themselves in a dead city in a world of eternal night. The crumbling ruins, the dread emerging from the ground, the chase, the forest, the wall of fog. The thought of the fog sends a shiver through me. I could remember all of it, all except for the ending. I clench my fists and look down in my lap. The ending. The ending. My senses come to life as I think back on my days on Night Springs. I can smell the cigarettes smoldering in the ashtrays. I can hear the thick, phlegmy coughs of the veteran riders as they sat around the table pitching ideas. I could feel the weight in the pit of my stomach, the tremble in my hands. I was the youngest in that room by far, but I was hungrier than they were. I was eager, desperate to make my mark. 
I remember sitting in the showrunner's office and during a round of notes, how it felt to not get the script perfectly right the first time. I remember I got notes about the ending. The ending. Did I struggle with the ending back then too? Is that why I'm struggling with it now? What I wouldn't give for something to read. Dog-eared, well-worn paperback. One that I would reread whenever I felt stuck. How often had I read that old thing? What was it called? I try to conjure the image of the book in my mind. It, ha it has no cover, only images of... And at that moment, it all comes back to me. The decaying city crumbles behind them as they run through the forest. Darren cries out in pain and clutches the bleeding wound in his side as Eloise pulls him down the forest path. The ground quakes and Adrian loses his footing, stumbling into Michelle, knocking them both into the dust and dirt. Alan watches and waits. Eloise and Darren come up against the wall of fog at the end of the path. They had run from the fog in the city. They look around for some other way out. The trees stand shoulder to shoulder. Michelle crawls along the dirt, trying to find her glasses. Instead, she finds something that makes her scream, first in fear, and then in delight. They all gather around and marvel at the discovery. A book bound in flesh, covered in ancient symbols of unknown origin. The dread's bellowing grows louder. Michelle flips through the book, squinting, trying to read the symbols. She has knowledge of the arcane. She knows the book can help them escape. She just has to find the right incantation and read it aloud, all without her glasses. Adrian gasps and points in the direction they came. A twisting, writhing silhouette blocks what little light remains in the sky. They all yell now, begging Michelle to read faster. Her fingers stop on a page. She doesn't know if it'll work, but she must try. She reads aloud the words, the language cutting through the air like rusty blades. As she speaks, a great blue orb appears around them, growing larger and larger until it explodes. And then, I did it. I remembered the ending of Dead of Night exactly as I had written it way back when. So why didn't it work? The script had ended with Michelle finding the book and reading the spell that sent them home. So why am I still here? Suddenly, I can smell cigarette smoke. And suddenly, I feel like a timid young writer again. The way the showrunner stubbed out his cigarette, the way he threw my script at me from across the desk. He called the ending a deus ex machina, said the book bound in flesh came out of nowhere. I hated the fact that he was right. He told me to try again, to make their escape mean something. I never felt so low as I did that day, so alone. Life before Alice was always so lonely. I remember the way Alice would sit next to me on the couch, listening. Not making suggestions, not soothing my ego, not stopping me from beating myself up about not being good enough to break through my writer's block. She would just sit there, with me, listening. I remember the way she would hold my hand. It was all she needed to do to calm me down, to slow down my racing heartbeat, ease the tightness in my chest, and open my mind to... I stopped dead in my tracks. Even now, Alice is helping me. I have the ending. I really have it this time. The decaying city crumbles behind them as they run through the forest. Eloise pulls Darren down the forest path and he cries out, clutching the bleeding wound in his side. The ground quakes and Adrian and Michelle stop each other from falling. They come to the end of the dark alley and Alan quivers at the sight of the wall of black fog. The trees stand shoulder to shoulder. The dread bellows as it gets closer. Alan knows what he must do to finish the episode. It's the same ending that went on the air years ago. He had celebrated that night with his friends. Which friends? And he had felt ten feet tall, an actual writing credit on Night Springs. Adrian gasps and points at the dread's twisting and writhing silhouette. They've tried to find any way out, but there is none. Except for the wall of fog. The showrunner had shaken my hand and flashed that crooked grin of his. It was the first time I really felt like a writer. Eloise takes Michelle's hand, and she takes Adrian's.
Eloise helps Darren cross the threshold of the fog and she follows. Then Michelle, then Adrian. They walk through the fog and vanish from sight. The end. Almost. The dread slithers down the path, bellowing louder than ever. Ellen grits his teeth. He's running out of time and he knows it. The wall of fog is calling to him now. Cold sweat beads on his forehead. This must have been how Eloise, Darren, Michelle, and Adrian felt. Trapped with only one way out. But where would that way lead? One last memory about his time on Night Springs came clear as a bell. He made sure the script ended on an ambiguous note. Where did the ominous fog lead? The real world? Or something worse altogether? Alan stands before the fog, trying to peer through. He knows he must act quickly. The dread will be upon him at any moment. But I have to be sure. I need a sign. The single speck of light flickers so suddenly, so brightly through the fog, that Alan almost starts the sight of it. A light in the dark. The light had always been there for him, ever since Alice went missing in Bright Falls. The light had been his guide, his savior. And here it is again. Alan reaches out to touch the fog. It's warm and inviting, like Alice's hand is warm in his. His racing heartbeat slows down. The tightness in his chest relaxes. Come on, she says with a smile. Let's go for a walk. And for a brief moment, she's there. Alan can feel her next to him as he crosses the wall of fog. He feels the sun on his face. A miracle in itself. Tears of joy well up inside. It's too much. And it slips away. Alan slips away. And fog turns to shadows.